I want to continue in this sermon series on Mark that we're calling Sketches because Mark weaves together little stories that are all pointing us to believing upon Jesus as the Son of God, our Savior. And by the time we get to Mark chapter 4, Jesus is wildly popular. And so Mark sets the scene for us. There is a very large crowd who has come to the edge of the sea. And Jesus is getting into the front of a boat to kind of use it as a makeshift platform so that he can deliver a message about the kingdom of God. And he begins the message with a curious word. Listen. And, and if you, you think about how he starts this, listen. Think about who these people are. They are there to listen. They are tired of the world as it is. They want the coming of the kingdom of God. They are oppressed by Rome. They hate the corruption. They hate the pagan godlessness of it all. If anyone in the world is listening, it's them, Jesus. Let me kind of help put you into the context of their curiosity. For those of you who are highly driven business type people, this is you spending a lot of time, money, effort, and energy to get to that conference that's high energy where there's going to be a whole lot of successful people who talk, and they're going to give you the secrets to the industry so that you can get in on the inside. Man, you are there to listen. This is you waiting in a long line to to get an autograph and a, a picture with your favorite athlete. You are staying there for hours just to get the moment to, to meet them and to hear what they've got to say. This is you at your the concert of your favorite band. The crowd is huge. The arena is full. And imagine the lead singer walks up to the microphone and says before he begins playing anything, I would like for you to listen to music today. Yeah, isn't that the point, right? (laughs) That's kind of why we're here. So it sounds a little bit redundant for Jesus to start off his talk with the word, listen. But then it gets even more weird. Because when he starts talking, it's completely unexpected what he's about to say. He tells a little farm story. He he talks about a guy sowing seed. It's not unfamiliar. Everybody gets it. Probably everybody's done it. And he goes through the scenario of how a sower sowed seed and some of it grows and some of it doesn't. And you're still waiting to figure out how he's going to wrap all this together. You're, you, got, you got your Twitter out. You're ready to Twitter that tweet, that big statement that's going to be the closing line of it all. And here it comes. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. He challenges them the way he opens. Listen. He's always challenging them to listen. Now, the Bible doesn't tell us the reaction of the crowd, but if the reaction of the disciples is any indication, probably everybody went away scratching their head. Verse 10, when he was alone, so the disciples get him backstage. Those around him with him and the twelve asked him, about the parables. The literal Greek translation is, uh, what was that? (laughs) What was that all about? All these people are here to hear you talk about the kingdom of God. You give them a little farm story? So now that they have this insider information, Jesus tells them the secret to the kingdom of God. And you know what the secret is? to the kingdom of God is listening. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, 
You have to have ears to hear. You have to pay attention to how you listen. That's the secret. And maybe the Savior is on to something because we know in our culture, we do a lot of talking. On social media, we do a lot of commenting, a lot of sharing, right? We want to share our opinion about everything. But I don't know that we are very good listeners. I recently read an article in the Wall Street Journal, and the headline read like this. A listening deficit plagues America. From 2020 vote to the January 6th to vaccines... And the article explains that there are a lot of people in our culture who are talking, but there's not a whole lot of listening going on. And so there's been this, these groups from both perspectives who've been raising money, and the, the entire point of them raising money is to facilitate people just getting together from opposing viewpoints, not to argue, but just to explain one another so that each of you cannot understand what the person is saying, but understand why they're saying what they're saying. They're listening sessions. Here's, here's a portion of the article. It says, in short, people are talking past one another. It isn't happening only in Washington or in political circles, but increasingly within communities and even within families. Yet, ironically, the problem isn't so much that Americans aren't talking enough. They're talking plenty. A significant part of the problem is that they've stopped listening. That is to say, too often Americans aren't listening to people on the other side closely enough to understand why they think what they think. Instead, the default position fueled by the shouting on social media has become immediately to move to anger and then to yell, you're just crazy. You see, we're talking, yelling, debating, but not listening. So maybe Jesus is on to something. Because it's one thing for us not to be good listeners in our politics. But if we are not good listeners when it comes to the kingdom of God, that is an eternal, fatal danger. So Jesus, in talking about the secret to the kingdom of God, gets all his disciples backstage and he says, here's the secret. You need to learn to listen. And so what I want us to do this morning is I want us to, to join with them in that huddle. And I want us to walk through these stories that he tells them, teaching them the art of listening so that they can enter into the kingdom of God. If you want to enter into the kingdom of God, you, you must, number one is this, we must hear what we need to hear rather than what we want to hear. Did you catch that? We need to hear what we need to hear rather than what we want to hear. Jesus leads off his response to their question in verse 13. Look at this. He's, Jesus said to them, Do you not understand this parable? That's an insightful question. Because you could answer that question in two ways. Number one, they all heard it. And number two, they all understood it. Nobody misunderstands what it means when a sower goes out to the field and sows. They see this every single day. But here's the problem. You can't just hear it and understand it your way. Because even though they would say, yes, we understood it, it's apparent they didn't get it, right? You see, they're not understanding really what he's talking about, really what it's about. And so he's letting them know, listen, I, yeah, guys, it's a story about a farmer. But just in case you don't understand, it's really not about farming. Right? Yes, I, I talked about a sower and a seed. 
that that's not really what it's all about. And so then he starts to walk them through it. Because when we get into a situation like this, sometimes we're paying more attention to what we want someone to say than what they're actually saying. FDR, President Roosevelt, apparently he was a pretty witty guy. And he was known to be somewhat of a jokester. And there's a story circulating around that he was in this big, one of these state dinners, you know, and you had all these dignitaries that were there to, to meet him. And so at the end of the meal, there was a receiving line, and he was standing there, and he's greeting all these people. And he's getting very bored with it all because everybody coming through the line says the same thing. Thank you for the invitation, Mr. President. It was a wonderful meal. It is wonderful to see you, Mr. Mr. President. Thank you. you know, just over and over. So he gets bored with all this. So the President of the United States, as people are going through the line, as he's shaking their hand, he leans in and he starts to say, I murdered my grandmother this morning. To every single person, he leans in, takes their hand. I murdered my grandmother this morning. Thank you, Mr. President. Oh, it was so wonderful to see you. Thank you for this meal. I murdered my grandmother this morning. Isn't that wonderful? Thank you. for. And it's apparent that people are not listening. Until at the end of the line, the ambassador from Bolivia comes through. And he leans in like he did to the others. I murdered my grandmother this morning. And the ambassador, without missing a beat, looked at him and said, she must have had it coming. Right? <laughs> Finally, somebody got it, right? Finally, somebody is not just saying what everybody says or hearing what they want to hear. Finally, somebody is paying attention to the, what is actually being told. And yes, the story tells about a sower in four different situations where seed is sown. Three fail, one bears fruit. But look at the interpretation that Jesus shares beginning in verse 13. He explains the parable. And if you look at this parable, if you look at the next parable... If you look at the following one down in verse 26, at the following one down in verse 30, you'll see a common element in them all. The common element in every story that you need to get is this. God is going to bring about a harvest. There will be people who, because of the influence of the Word of God, bear fruit. And their influence in the world will grow like a mustard seed into a mustard tree. The influence of the kingdom of God will not only grow in them, but it will grow with them organically, kind of like a seed goes into the soil. And if you'll notice in the first parable that he tells, there's one common element. All the soils are different, but the seed is always the same. He tells you the seed is the Word of God. And what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says that God is going to bring about a harvest. The Word of God says that the world that He created has fallen into sin. It is under a curse. But He has sent His Son into the world to die for our sin, to rise from the dead, so that we might repent of sin and be saved and be a part of the kingdom of God. That is, in every single page, in all 66 books, that is the essential story of the Word of God. Are you listening? Jesus, we would like for you to heal. Yes, I heal, but I want you to repent. Repent. Jesus, will you cast out our demons? Well, yes, I can do that. I've exhibited my power. But are you listening? Because I can cast out your demons, but that doesn't mean you're entering the kingdom of heaven. 
Jesus, we would like for you to make us successful. We would like for you to make our days fruitful. We would love for you to touch our business. Give us good days. Help us through our tragedies. Fix and clean up our mistakes. Yes, I can do all that. Yes, the word of God will bring you comfort. Yes, the word of God will bring you healing. But are you listening to what it's saying that without repentance and faith, you will not enter the kingdom of God? You see, sometimes we only hear what we want to hear. And whenever you hear that essential message of the Word of God that you have to repent of your sin in order to enter into the kingdom, we go, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. but get on to the other stuff. Why does that happen? Why is it sometimes we only hear what we want to hear? It all has to do with the soil. And so Jesus explains there's three different situations of why the seed gets into some soils and it doesn't bear fruit. And, and you have to understand a little bit about the cultural aspect of, of how they would plow a field. Now, you and I till a field and then we go and sow the seed. That's not the way they did it in that time. In that time, they would sow the seed, then they would plow and till the field. The, the seed would be on top of the soil and then... You would, you would turn it over. You would put the seed under by the, the agitation of the soil. And in doing that, there's some things that happen. One part is a hardened ground. This is where they had to walk. This is where you had to work. And it just became like a hardened sidewalk. The, the soil was a lot of times full of limestone. And so this would almost become like pavement. The seed there never had a chance. Why? Because notice in the story, the birds come and eat it. But Jesus says this is not about birds, but a spiritual opponent. He said when the word is sown, when they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Man, you have spiritual opposition that is always working for you not to get it. He wants to harden you. He wants to distract you. He wants to discourage you. Listen, there's so many people who won't hear the Word of God simply because He's got them so distracted with everything else going on in the world. They never even get there. And if they get there, they walk out because, man, their heart is not receptive at all. They, they heard everything everybody else did, but there's nothing that makes its way into their life. They, Satan comes, they didn't even hear it. The second group he describes as being shallow. They barely heard it. He says, this group, man, it gets in there, and it springs up quickly. It says, immediately they receive it with joy, verse 16. But when they have no root in themselves, they endure for a little while. Then, look at this, when tribulation or persecution arises... On account of the word, immediately they fall away. There's no depth of earth. They barely heard it. Man, they, they, they look so exciting in the beginning, but when a trial of life came, it just, it just they melted away. They, there was no depth to get them through that trial. Now, I want us to put this in perspective. Jesus is talking to some people that when it comes to their faith, there will be blood. There is going to be massive amounts of persecution. You realize you and I live in a time in which persecution is more now against Christians than at any other time in human history? You realize you're living through a tribulation time? So let's put this in perspective for us. If Jesus can look at the persecuted and say they didn't make it if they renounced their faith because of persecution, because they were shallow, what do you think he thinks about us when we fall away from Jesus because we went on vacation? There are people around the world that do not continue with Jesus because they don't want to die. 
We have a hard time continuing with Jesus because you hear this all the time. You ever heard of this? Well, man, we just got out of the habit. Wait a minute. Shallow. It looks good when everything's going good, but man, when the trial comes, it's tough. Acts 14, 22, strengthening the souls of the disciples, encouraging them to continue in the faith, saying that through many tribulations, we must enter the kingdom of God. Our Savior expects you to survive your vacation. <laughs> to get through it and then to get deep, man. Come on. Shallow. And then the other problem is secular, worldly. They, they heard what they wanted to hear. There are others, verse 18, that were sown among the thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things that enter in, they choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. In other words, they get it. But at some point, they come to an impasse. And here's the problem with secular. When, whenever you enter into the faith and you just want to add it to everything else, it won't work. Now, it'll give you some good morality. It'll help you to have better days. It'll give you a better outlook. It's, it's positive. I mean, it, it's good stuff to live your life by. There's a lot of wisdom in the book of Proverbs but at some point, listen to me, if you really live out the Word of God, this may shock you, it's going to ask you to do some things that the world doesn't agree with. <gasps> it's going to ask you to have some opinions about some things that God says that the world goes, no, you must tolerate this. Well, I want, I, I want to accommodate all these viewpoints and all these... And, and all of a sudden, the Word of God says, but this is what the Word of God says about sex outside of marriage. This is what the Word of God says about homosexuality. This is what the Word of God says about drunkenness. This is what the Word of God says about greed. This is what the Word of God says about giving. And it's really cool as long as it's positive, but when it puts you at an impasse... Our desire to fit into the world chokes it. And you know, Jesus always talks about money in a curious way. Because he talks about it as if money and the cares of the world and Christ in the human heart compete for the same place. And listen to me. He doesn't make the choice of who wins. You do. You cannot serve God and the world. A man can't have two masters. He'll either love the one and hate the other, right? I mean, all the time, if you really follow Christ, at some point, he'll put you at an impasse. And some people, that impasse, it chokes any amount of growth that was there getting them toward fruitful faith. But here's the good news. We do have some people that received it. Man, and it sprung forth and it bore fruit, some more than others, but thank God there are fruitful people. Watch the difference. Their soil was receptive. And it got in there and it grew. So that brings me to the next point. The second thing about the kingdom of heaven, and you're listening, if you want to enter the kingdom of heaven, we must learn to apply rather than approve. Learn to apply rather than approve. In a string of agricultural stories, there's one of these things that's like Sesame Street. It seems like it just doesn't belong here. Because think about this, we're sowing seed, if you look at uh, verse 26, it's about seed growing, if you look at verse 30, it's about the mustard seed and the mustard tree, verse 21 is about a lamp. <laughs> what? Wait a minute. <laughs> Let me tell you a story about farming and furniture, right? I mean, well, what is this? He's so wild in the way that he does things. But it's kind of an indication that this one right here is really important 
because it's the key to interpret it all. Is a lamp brought to be put under a basket or under a bed? And not on a stand. Nothing is hidden except that it's made manifest. And anything secret except that it come to light. In other words, he says, you put that lamp out there so you can see stuff. And the more you bring out, that lamp brings more light to that situation. It just continuously reveals. So verse 23. Here's how you got to approach the Word of God. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, here it is, pay attention to what you hear. With what measure you use it, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That word measure is the same word we get the word metric from. It's measurable. It's deliberate. You can can judge whether you made it to where you want it to go. Are you short or are you long, right? It's a very measurable, purposeful, intentional, defined response to the Word of God. The word measured means that you can't just be passive and hear it. Measured does not ask the question, Did you like that sermon? Yeah. I thought it was a little long and kind of hard on some. Yeah, it was cool. It's good. It's good. Yeah. That's not measured. That's approving. Listen, measured is not even asking if you agree. Well, did you agree with some of this? Yeah, I mean, yeah, man, yeah. Christian, yes. We need to do better about our sin. No, that's not measured. Measured, listen, you may not like it, you may not agree with it, but measured says, Jesus said it, how do I live it? Measured says, what needs to change? Measured is intentionality. Listen to me. Measured is not just you hearing this sermon. Measured is you getting back into this passage and spending some time in in it the rest of the week. What do I need to do to be a better listener to the kingdom of God? I want to make sure that I'm entering into it. It's not about approval or agreement. It's about application. It's about putting the lamp of the Word of God in your life and bringing everything to the light of it. Now, here's something very interesting. Throughout this passage of Scripture, I noticed that sometimes the word grow is repeated, and there's a lot of words about growing in this passage, right? Added unto you, increase, grow, sprout, spring, a lot of words like that. But here's what we miss between English and Greek. Even though it all kind of looks like the same word, Jesus is actually using about five different words for growth. And if you are having a measured response to the word of God, I think this is instructive of us. There's growth that Jesus talks about, things are added. It more will be added to you. The word added means you get to the next marker. You make it to the next point. There's an expectation of increasing maturity in the Christian life. In the book of Hebrews, he chides the people, shouldn't we be past the elementary stuff by now? You're still in the ABCs of your faith. Grow a little bit, man. You're 16 years old and you're driving to the third grade of Christianity. (laughs) Get on with it. That's that's what he's talking about, this idea of added. Given. I I love this. That word means that you put something in another place. It is deposited to you something you didn't have before. Here's something interesting and blessed about the Christian life. There are some things in your Christian growth God's just going to give you. He's going to gift it to you. The gifts of the Spirit increase of your faith. Some of these things, man, you couldn't get through it unless he just gave it to you. Now, here's the problem. We would like it all to be like that. God, make me better. (laughs) But he doesn't do that. There's other types of growth that we have to respond to, work at. takes a lot of time. Another word is the word sprouts. 
It means it takes root. It's, it's organic. It's beginning to be a fruit-bearing plant. It breaks through the soil. And here's the cool thing about a little bitty plant. It has everything it ever needs to mature within it. It just needs to be fed. Whenever you got saved, listen, you got as much of the Holy Spirit as you're ever going to get. But you need to respond to Him. You need to be in the Word of God. He's in there to grow you, to make you more like Christ. The next word is the word spring up. It emphasizes the leaves and the foliage. We're, we're beginning to see the maturing of it. It's a quick, immediate response. And man, isn't it exciting. And boy, we have a lot of Christian babies in our church. A lot of new birth last year. Thank God for that. And I want to tell you, people being saved, nothing brings more excitement in the church than to have a bunch of Christian babies going around who've just been birthed in the kingdom of God. You know why? Because they want to eat everything. They, they want to be in every class. They want to do everything. They're so curious and they're just soaking it in. And they are blowing up in their Christian growth. And it's so exciting. They're on fire. But I want to caution our young Christians. You are at a, such a special place in your Christian growth right now, but it's not always going to be like this. The speed of maturation slows down. Because right now, it's all new to you. Man, just like having a baby in the house, the first step is amazing. The first word is amazing. The first green bean is unbelievable. But then, hey, listen, that's not that it's not as exciting. It's not that it's not important. But there's some growth in your life. You got to get past just branching out new little leaves, man. Now we got to start growing some limbs. Because listen, the fruit doesn't hang on leaves, the fruit hangs on limbs. You need the leaves, but you got to grow the limbs. And then I love this. He uses the word grows in several different ways, but there's actually two different words that we translate the same way in English. Grows, gets taller, matures, long, steady process. This is what we want. Man, this is acorns to oaks. But then the word grows, like in verse 32, it's, it's like ascending, rising. It's the same word that's used when you board a ship. You go from the dock up into the vessel, and it's going to take you to a different place. And this is a point where a lot of us, it reveals where we're shadowed. Listen to me. Sometimes in your growth, you're going to get to a, you think, and hey, those of you who have, have walked with Jesus for a long time, I need an amen on this so the rest of them can get what I'm saying is true because they think they're the only ones going through this. You were blowing up. It was exciting. You were getting it. And dude, you thought you had it all in the Christian life. And then something hit that broke you down. And you went through a hard transition place. And all of a sudden, you began to have a crisis of faith where none of it made sense. But then you got to the other side of it and you realize how you went from the dock up into the ship and that time of growth wasn't that God left you, it was that he took you to a different place. If that's ever been your experience, could I get, and some of you have never said it before out loud in this church, but could I please get an amen from some of you? I hope the young Christians heard that. Because if you follow Jesus... Grow is tough sometimes. Measured response. So the measured response that gets you into the kingdom of God, listen, is not just approving and agreeing. The measured response is applying. What do I need to pray about? What do I need to work on? What is God bringing me through? What is he doing to grow my life? And then very quickly, I know I've talked way too long this morning. If we want to enter the kingdom of God... Number three, we must realize that decisions are directions. Decisions are directions. He said to them, pay attention to what you hear. With what measure you use it, it'll be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who is not, even what he has will be taken away. In other words, he says, if you keep responding like this, listen to me. If you keep responding like this, you're going to get better at your response. 
He, he bears this out in, in the beginning. He says, but for, uh, this is the reason I speak in, in parables. For those outside, everything is parables. So that they may indeed see and not perceive. They may indeed hear but not understand, lest they turn and be forgiven. He's not saying I'm putting it everything in code so that some people will never get it. What he's saying is if they keep responding the way they want to respond, they'll never get it. If they keep hearing only what they want to hear, they'll never get it. It's just a farm story. But here's the grace of it all. I love how he ends this with his disciples, verse 33. With many such parables he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples, he explained everything. So you see, the Savior's not trying to hide anything. But he wants to make sure you're listening to what he's saying. And if you want to know more, he'll reveal it to you. Here's the grace of that. The grace of that is, listen, God wants to bring about a harvest. And he's going to. Of people who bear fruit and of a kingdom that grows in its influence, like a mustard seed grows into a mustard tree. He's going to accomplish this. Now... I don't have a farm. Mamma and Papa all, all both had farms, right? Both of them had farms. And I know this. They plowed every year. You know what the wonder of God is in this story? For the hardened soil, he doesn't quit. He comes back next year and he plows again. For the worldly soil, he doesn't give up on it. He comes back and he plows again. For the shallow soil, you know, you know what? We didn't know how much rock was there until it was plowed, and then holy smokes, look at that. I will never grow some seed there. But you know what they do? They get the rocks out, and he plows it again. Listen, and if that's your response to the Word of God, even though you don't get it right now, if you'll get the rocks out and you'll look at your soul, whenever it hits you and it plows you and you go, whew, hmm, I, I got to, I'm not, I'm not ready. I need to work some things out because, man, I want to get it. Listen, if you measure the response to that, it's going to be measured back to you. And God's going to keep working with you and he's going to keep plowing you but you got to stay responsive to that. Listen, a decision is a direction. But if you're like, oh, uh, like 30 minutes. You are going to become a master of that response. And you'll just keep getting better at it of giving yourself excuses of why this isn't really for you. And you'll justify yourself. What you measure to it, it will be measured back to you. And listen, at some point, and when it comes to the harvest, it will be too late. But right now, he's plowing, y'all. Respond. Listen. And you will enter into the kingdom of of heaven. Would you bow your head and close your eyes with me for just a moment? If you're here this morning and you say, man, I, I, man, my heart has been plowed. The rocks are out. The weeds are there. And I am asking God to work in the soil of me, to save me. You come. We'll take the word of God. Man, we will put more seed in there. He just keeps sowing. So respond. Come this morning and be saved. Maybe there's other things that you need to pray about this morning. You come to this altar, but I want to pray for you, and then we're going to stand together and respond to what God's telling us to do. Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, Lord, with receptive soil, with hardened soil, with rocky soil, with thorny soil. Lord Jesus, we pray you keep plowing, keep sowing into our heart until we receive it and enter the kingdom of heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand together?